Welcome to our channel, where we dive into the ups and downs of cute girl relationships and the challenges people face in their everyday lives. Today, we're starting with a story that hits close to home. I hate my mother-in-law. From the moment I met her, I knew she didn't like me, and accepting me as her daughter-in-law was never easy for her. But this time, she went too far, pushing me to the point where I couldn't hold back anymore. I had to air her dirty laundry. Now, you might think I'm just a sweet and caring person, the kind you'd compare to a harmless kitten. But my mother taught me something important. When people are mean for no reason, you need to stand up for yourself, even if it means fighting dirty. And this time, my mother-in-law decided to be the biggest troublemaker in the family, assuming I wouldn't fight back. But she was wrong. My husband works in the film industry as part of the technical staff, which means he travels all over the world for various shoots. One of the perks of his job is that sometimes he invites me or the whole family to join him on these trips, giving us the chance to go sightseeing. This month, we had a trip to New Caledonia planned, a trip that had been on the calendar for a while. Everything was set, and my mother-in-law and I even made it to the airport on time, which was a small miracle considering the traffic. We unloaded all our bags at the airport, and I carefully counted to make sure we hadn't forgotten anything. Feeling confident that everything was in order, we headed inside. My mother-in-law asked me to drop off our luggage at the baggage counter, so I separated my hand luggage from the checked-in bags and asked her to do the same. Then I told her to go ahead with the security check while I finished up with the luggage drop-off. After completing the luggage drop-off, I went through the security check myself and started looking for my mother-in-law. I spotted her from a distance, and she seemed to be searching for something. When I approached her, she told me that one of her handbags was missing the one that contained her diabetes medication. She insisted that she couldn't leave without it. I told her to take a deep breath and try to remember if she might have accidentally left the bag with the rest of the luggage. She seemed flustered and couldn't recall, so she asked me to check if it was there. Dutifully, I went back to the baggage counter and asked the attendant if any luggage had been left behind or if one of our bags had gone overweight since one was missing. Unfortunately, the attendant said everything was in order and there were no unmarked or extra bags. Feeling dejected, I headed back to my mother-in-law, but before I could go through the security check again, airport security stopped me and asked me to follow them. Confused, I asked what was going on, but they insisted that everything would be explained once I came with them. They led me to a private holding area where they informed me that a woman had reported me. Apparently, she overheard me using the words gun and drugs, and she feared I might be a terrorist. They said they needed to ensure I wasn't hiding anything. I was absolutely furious. I hadn't made any such comments. I barely had time to check in before our flight. Then, a chilling thought crossed my mind. My mother-in-law. It suddenly hit me that she might be behind this. I told the officers I would fully cooperate with their investigation, confident that they would find nothing. After an exhausting 18 of questioning and searching, I was finally cleared. Once the ordeal was over, I showed the officer who had mentioned the woman's report a picture of my mother-in-law and asked if she was the one who reported me. When he confirmed it was her, a wave of rage surged through me. I walked out of there fuming with anger. This was the last straw. I had tolerated her slanders and toxic behavior for too long because I rarely saw her, but this time, she had gone too far. I couldn't just sit back and let her get away with it. It was time to teach her a lesson she would never forget. My first move was to expose her in her precious suburban neighborhood. She loved to show off and pretend she was something she wasn't, and I knew just how to shatter that illusion. I had been to a few of the neighborhood parties when visiting with my husband, so I knew exactly how they all tried to outdo each other. My mother-in-law was no different, often passing off cheap bakery treats as creations from a famous chef. I decided it was time to reveal the truth and expose all her secrets. When I invited everyone over, I decided it was time to expose the truth. I revealed where the so-called gourmet sweets actually came from a local bakery, not the high-end patisserie my mother-in-law had bragged about. I didn't stop there. I also exposed her imported English vase, which she claimed was a rare find from Australia, but was actually a mass-produced item available on Etsy. Watching her lies unravel and her reputation crumble in front of her friends brought me a sense of satisfaction. 
But I wasn't done yet I had one more card to play. Since I was already at her house, I decided to wait for my father-in-law to return home. When he arrived, he was surprised to see me, knowing I was supposed to catch a flight back to Portland that day. He asked why I hadn't left, and I told him there was something important he needed to know. I shared with him that I had recently learned about my mother-in-law's affair with one of the assistant directors during our trip to the Bahamas. I explained that my husband had told me about it after hearing it from one of the set staff who had caught them together in the prop room. My husband had wanted to keep it a secret, not wanting to be the one to cause trouble in their marriage. But after everything my mother-in-law had put me through, especially at the airport, I felt no such obligation. I wanted her to suffer the consequences of her actions. So, I laid everything out in front of my father-in-law, leaving nothing unsaid. The next day, I left her house, confident that her pretentious little life was about to fall apart. Despite the satisfaction of exposing her lies, I couldn't shake a nagging feeling that I might have gone too far. In my anger, I may have hurt my husband by revealing the truth about his mother's affair. I regretted that part a little, and I couldn't help but wonder was I being the a-hole here? A week passed, and I found out that my mother-in-law had returned home. Before she did, though, she had already tried to stir up trouble. She told my husband that I hadn't gone to New Caledonia because I was tired of traveling all the time just to spend a few days with him. She claimed I didn't think it was worth the effort anymore. That lying woman actually thought she could create a misunderstanding between us. It took me nearly three hours to reassure my husband that I love our life together and that I miss the plane due to a simple misunderstanding. I decided not to explain everything to him over the phone, especially after I had already revealed his mother's affair to his father. I knew that once she arrived home, she would find the mess waiting for her, and I was eagerly anticipating the call I was sure to receive once she did. Now, I'm just waiting for that moment, and when it happens, I'll be ready to update her on what I've done. I finally got to see her reaction, and let me tell you, I did not expect my mother-in-law to show up at my house unannounced. When she did, I was both surprised and a bit relieved, because it meant I could witness firsthand the fury on her face as she grappled with the chaos that her life had become. The look of sheer anger she gave me when I politely invited her in was all the satisfaction I needed. The moment she stepped inside, she exploded with rage. She screamed at me, calling me all sorts of names, and told me that I had no right to do what I did. She said I was a jerk and that karma would surely come back to bite me. According to her, I should be ashamed of causing strife in the family. She even went as far as to say that I didn't deserve her son, claiming she had known all along that sooner or later I would show my true colors. I could see she was on the verge of slapping me, but somehow, she held herself back. Her outburst reignited all the anger I had been suppressing for so long. I couldn't hold back any longer and told her that she was lucky I only exposed her secrets. If I had really wanted to get back at her, I could have pressed charges for the false accusations she made against me at the airport. After that, I told her to get out of my house. But instead of feeling better, I felt worse. It's been three months since that confrontation, and a lot has happened since then. My mother-in-law has been fighting non-stop with my father-in-law ever since I exposed her affair. Initially, I thought it was a one-time thing, but it turns out she was still seeing that person, and she eventually confessed this to my father-in-law. Once he found out, he kicked her out of the house, and she's been living with her sister ever since. Two weeks, I went to talk to my father-in-law because the guilt was eating me up. I felt responsible for the fights between them, but he assured me I had nothing to feel guilty about. He told me this wasn't the first time something like this had happened, but it was definitely the last. They are now separated, and he has no intention of getting back together with her. I'm left feeling conflicted about everything. They still haven't told my husband about the separation, and they've asked me to keep it a secret until he returns home. My father-in-law wants to be the one to break the news to him in person. I'm just waiting for the right time, but it's hard to know how to feel about all of this. I know my in-laws had been lying to my husband for a while, pretending they had worked things out between them. It made me feel like I was caught in the middle, like an unfaithful wife, even though I never wanted any of this to happen. Finally, my husband came home last week, and five days ago, he met with my father-in-law. That's when he found out about his parents' separation. 
To my surprise, he was pretty understanding about it. But when he learned that I was the one who had triggered this whole mess, he was understandably upset. He asked me why I had done all of this, and I explained everything starting from what happened at the airport to all the things that had happened before then. I apologized to him, telling him that I already felt guilty about my actions. I never intended for things to escalate this far. Thankfully, my husband understood the situation and said that this was bound to come out eventually. We're not completely okay yet, but I'm hopeful that, with time, we'll be fine. Now, looking back, I realized that while my mother-in-law was certainly out of line, my actions were also harsh. I agree with those who think what I did was wrong. By trying to take her down, I ended up hurting my father-in-law and betraying the trust my husband had in me when he confided about the affair. That's not something I'm proud of, and it definitely makes me look like the bad guy in this situation. I have to admit, both my mother-in-law and I acted immaturely, like we were in some kind of middle school drama. Instead of communicating and resolving our issues like adults, we both made choices that led to this entire mess. It's clear that we both share the blame, and honestly, we deserve the fallout that came from it. On a different note, I also wanted to share something else that's been weighing on my mind. I'm a 21-year-old female, and I have a 25-year-old cousin who got engaged about five months ago. While preparing for the wedding, my cousin mentioned she wanted to wear a diamond necklace to match her reception gown. My aunt then asked if I could let her borrow the diamond necklace that I inherited from my great-grandmother after her passing. Everyone in my family knows how much that necklace means to me. It's the last thing I have for my great-grandmother, and it's incredibly special. So, I flat out refused and told them that the necklace is very delicate and I didn't want to share it. I even offered to let her use another necklace that I got from my grandfather, but she insisted on having that specific one. I had to be firm and strictly forbade anyone from touching that necklace. As much as I wanted to be accommodating, I couldn't risk something happening to the last piece I have from my great-grandmother. I thought I had made it very clear that the necklace was off-limits, but on the day of the reception, I noticed my cousin wearing the exact same necklace. I was furious, but I chose not to make a scene. It was her wedding, after all, and I didn't want to ruin it for her. When I asked my mother about it, she told me that my father had tried to stop my cousin from borrowing the necklace, but she kept pestering him until he finally gave in. Even though I was angry, I couldn't really blame my dad. My cousin can be incredibly persistent and difficult to deal with. After the reception ended and the party started, I quietly took back my necklace and left the venue without saying a word. The next day, after everyone had sobered up, I received a call from my cousin, who was crying and accusing me of stealing her jewelry. Her husband got on the phone and even threatened to press charges. I calmly explained to him that the necklace rightfully belonged to me and that my cousin had borrowed it without my permission. He didn't believe me and called me a liar, insisting that I was the one who had borrowed her jewelry. At that point, my mother, who had been listening to the whole conversation, had had enough and ended the call. Later, some of my relatives criticized me for taking back the necklace without saying anything and even called me an a-hole for not sharing it from the start, claiming that it didn't really belong to me. I might have been seen as an a-hole for not sharing, but I can't understand what I did wrong by reclaiming what was mine. The necklace was always mine, and I didn't think it was wrong to take it back after it was borrowed without my consent. Now, I'm left wondering how to address the situation with my dad. I've never had to confront him before, and I'm unsure how to go about it. Should I ask him to give me the key to the safe where my jewelry is kept, or should I just ask him not to give away my things without asking me first? My dad has apologized, but he's still hesitant about letting me have control over the safe for my jewelry. My aunt eventually called and asked them not to press charges, so now I'm just waiting to see how things turn out. As for me, I'm not sure if I'm in the wrong here. Some people might think I could have handled it differently, but I believe that taking back what was rightfully mine was the right thing to do. I know you're young, but it's important to start securing anything valuable from now on. No one else should have access to your personal belongings. Your father shouldn't have handed over your necklace to your cousin, especially without telling you. It's time to invest in a small safe where you can keep your valuables safe and secure. It's too easy for someone to borrow something like that and never return it. Since you're 20, getting your own safe and moving everything important into it is a wise decision.
Your property is yours, and your father shouldn't have been the one to give it away, even to family. You should also consider asking your father to call your cousin and her husband to make it clear that any attempt to press charges will be met with legal action, such as a cease and desist order. It sounds like your cousin may have been envious of your necklace all along and used her wedding as an excuse to take something she felt more entitled to than you. She's seven years older, so she might have some feelings about it, but that doesn't justify what she did. Talk to your father, get your things back, and get your own safe. Clearly, he can't be trusted not to give in to pressure and loan out your belongings after you've already said no. On a different note, my sister, who is 24, has been living with me, 26-year-old female, for the past three years. I told her she could stay with me as long as she wanted, but she needed to follow my rules. One of the main rules is that she can't have men over. She can invite people in, but they can't stay overnight. I've been pretty lenient, honestly. She's had both male and female friends stay overnight without my permission, and I didn't say anything because I knew her friends and didn't think it was a big deal. But last week, she crossed the line by bringing a stranger into our home without my knowledge. I was home at the time, and she waited until she thought I was fully asleep before letting the man in. She probably thought I wouldn't notice and wouldn't get caught, but this morning, I woke up really early and saw an extra pair of shoes that didn't belong to either of us. That's when I realized someone else was in the house. After the stranger left, I confronted my sister and told her that what she did was completely disrespectful and not okay. I warned her that if she ever does it again, she'll have to move out. My mom thinks I'm overreacting and should just let it slide because my sister is young and wants to enjoy her life. I don't want to be the strict, boring sister, but my sister and my mom both know how deeply shaken I was when someone tried to break into my home while I was alone. That experience left me feeling scared and vulnerable, and it's the main reason I'm so cautious about having strangers in my house. It's not just a small rule. It's about feeling safe in my own home. My sister has been living with me for free, and I've been okay with that because she's family. I love her, and I want to help her out. But when she disrespects my boundaries, it crosses a line. I've made it clear that if she does something like this again, I won't hesitate to ask her to leave. It's not something I want to do, but I need to protect my own peace of mind. I really appreciate all the advice and honest feedback you all have given me. I guess I needed to hear it from others to really understand what I should do. My sister is my only sibling, and because of that, I've always felt a strong responsibility to take care of her. But now I realize that part of caring for her is also giving her some tough love when it's needed. After talking things over, we've decided that it's best for her to move back in with our mom. She does have a job, but she's gotten used to me paying for everything, and I see now that I've been enabling her behavior. This situation has taught me an important lesson— while she'll always be my family, she needs to grow up and learn to take care of herself. It's my house, and that means it's my rules. Sure, my sister is an adult, and she's entitled to have guests over. But it's just basic courtesy to let the other people in the house know when someone is coming over, especially when it's a stranger. Bringing strangers into our home without telling me isn't just inconsiderate, it's also unsafe. My sister knew exactly why I have this rule in place. She was fully aware of my past experience and how it's made me extra cautious. Yet, she still chose to break the rule. If our mom thinks it's not a big deal, then maybe my sister should move back in with her and see how long it takes before our mom gets upset when she brings strangers home. My sister is 24 years old, not 15. I've been more than generous by letting her live with me for free, even when she's broken some very basic rules of common courtesy. I have a very valid reason for not wanting strangers in my home, and if my mom and sister can't understand that, it's on them. I've decided that I need to stand firm. It's my house, and my rules should be respected. If my sister can't follow them, then she'll need to find a new place to live. There's no reason for me to feel bad about this situation. My mom and sister might be trying to make me feel guilty, but I've realized that I can't let them manipulate my feelings. I don't deserve that, and I'm not going to allow it to happen. If my mom really believes that my sister is just young and should be allowed to do whatever she wants, then she can take her in. The truth is, my sister's behavior is putting both of us in danger. We're three women living alone, and it's just not smart or safe to bring a strange man into our home, especially without my knowledge. 
And really, if she wanted to spend time with this guy, why didn't she go to his place? Maybe he doesn't have a place of his own, or maybe he's already living with someone else. Either way, my sister's refusal to take my rules seriously means she needs to find her own place. That way, she can invite people over whenever she wants, and I can have the peace of mind I need. In the end, I love my sister, and I want the best for her. But part of that means helping her understand the importance of respecting other people's boundaries. She needs to learn that her actions have consequences, and if she can't respect my rules, she'll have to face the reality of finding her own place to live. I'm Mike, 51 years old, and I'm a novelist. Growing up in an orphanage, I always longed for a family. Eventually, I got married and had the family I always wanted. I was so happy and promised to cherish it forever. When I married my wife Alina, she had a 19-year-old daughter named Lily. Lily is now a respected editor at a publishing company. She has always loved novels, especially the works of the anonymous novelist Tom. She became an editor just to meet him. Tom's books are big hits, making him a best-selling author. There's a rumor that Tom will soon reveal his face in an exclusive interview and a paid online article at Lily's company. At the start of our marriage, not knowing how to connect, I focused on earning money for my daughter and becoming someone she could respect. I took care of household chores and never missed family outings and events. Even though I never knew a family growing up, I tried my best to give love to ours. But today, something unexpected happened. Today is my daughter's wedding day. Her partner, Brian, is into photography. Because of my busy schedule, I've only spoken to Brian via video calls and never met him in person, but he seems like a decent guy. Just before the wedding, I entered the bride's dressing room where my daughter and wife were. Suddenly, Lily said to me, you old man with no blood relation, get out. She used to adore me as if we were blood related, and I thought we were close. I was confused by her words. I've been looking forward to the day I could get revenge on you for bullying mom. There's no seat for you today, she added. I had no idea what she was talking about. My wife just smirked upon hearing this. I was confused. Then my wife handed me a fill-out divorce form. I needed to think, so I left the dressing room to be alone. That's when I first met Brian. Mike, hello. Ah, yes. Can't believe we're meeting here. Is work, okay. Work? Oh, well, yeah. It seemed Lily told Brian. I couldn't attend the wedding because of work. I felt awkward about what had just happened. Could we talk for a moment? Then I learned a shocking truth. After hearing it, I decided to leave. I filed for divorce, took my things, and left the house. I rented an apartment and now live there alone. A month after the wedding, my wife called. Hello, it's been a while. I thought it's about time we discussed dividing the assets. I've been a housewife with no income, so I'll need more than the usual amount. You need to buy the apartment we lived in and give it to me. I need a place to live. I'd rather not. I instinctively replied. Her demanding tone irked me, especially after how she treated me a month ago. Did she really think I'd agree? I said no, didn't I? I refuse to divide the property or buy the apartment. You think it's okay for me to be left homeless? Well, it's your own doing, isn't it? I told her something I learned from Brian. My wife panicked. How do you know that? Why don't you stop dodging the question? This is seriously infuriating. Ah, it's just the worst. Why does it always have to be me who ends up like this? Please, forget about it, Mike. Really, I'm begging you. Annoyed by my wife's wailing, I tried to continue the conversation. How long will you keep tormenting mom, you old man? Eh, Lily. Suddenly, Lily took the phone. Just get on with the property division already. I don't know what you're talking about, but you were bullying mom, weren't you? Mom's crying, you know, and you always made her cry like this. No, calm down, Lily. You see, making excuses is so lame. That's just unacceptable. Just pay mom the property division and compensation for all the bullying. You're the worst old man. So I'm the worst old man, huh? When will you pay? Wait a minute. Right now, I'm getting help from a lawyer. Let's discuss the future with the lawyer. Why do you need a lawyer? Well, is that okay? Fine, whatever you say. We're still the victims here. We agreed to meet a week later at the law firm I had hired, and the call ended. Thus, the day of the showdown was set for a week later. 
I had a well thought out plan prepared over the past month. That's why I took the call and set the appointment for two weeks later. On the day, my wife, daughter, and I gathered at the office with the lawyer. The four of us sat around a single table. My wife and daughter had grim expressions and glared at me. Let's begin discussing the divorce and property division between Mike and Alina. However, before that, Mike has something he wants to ask Lily. Me? Yeah, I have one thing I want to ask you. Please go ahead, Mike. I don't want to. The lawyer was surprised by my daughter's sudden refusal. Why do you get to take the lead? After all, it's dad who's the bad one here. I find this very unpleasant. Can you stop talking down to me? I agree. Lawyer, please get it together. Ah, yes. Understood. The lawyer looked troubled. My daughter and wife's assertive attitudes had him flustered. I spoke gently to my angry daughter. What I want to know is the part where you said it's originally my fault. What did I do wrong? What have I done? Please tell me one last time. When I pleaded with my head bowed, Lily was silent for a while before reluctantly telling me, Dad, you've been cheating all along, haven't you? The dad before you cheated and left us. I loved him so much. It hurt me so much to be betrayed so easily, choosing another woman over mom, choosing his desires over his daughter. It all hurt. Seeing mom cry every day was the hardest part. That's why I can't forgive cheating. I see. And what does that have to do with me? It has everything to do with you. You're cheating, aren't you? I knew because mom told me you've been cheating for a long time. I thought you were different from that betrayer. I was confused by my daughter's story. I've never cheated Lily. Calm down. I've never cheated, not even once. That's a lie. It's the truth. I swear to God I haven't. What exactly did mom tell you? Glancing at my wife, she looked away uncomfortably like a child caught just before being scolded for a prank. She told me that dad was always away from home because he was meeting his mistress. When the phone rings and he's whispering, it's because it's from his mistress. I saw it once and the name of the caller was a woman's name. I knew what my daughter was talking about, but it wasn't cheating. I had another secret. As I took out an envelope from my bag, I asked my daughter, I heard about the previous dad cheating and running away before we got married from your mom. He's a terrible man. Hearing that story, I swore I'd never cheat. There's one thing I want you to confirm. What is it? Taking out a photo from the envelope, I showed it to her. It showed my wife and her ex-husband Eric walking arm in arm. What is this? Brian took this photo of the Lena's cheating scene. Brian did? Lily and Elena were shocked. Brian really did a professional job. He captured both of their expressions clearly in the photo. The wrinkles on Alina's face were also perfectly visible, showing it was a recent photo. This was what Brian told me on the day of the wedding. When he went to a tourist spot for a photo shoot, he saw my wife with an unknown man. They were holding hands, clearly a couple. Brian, who knows my face, suspected an affair. Imagining the worst, he took a photo just in case. There's not just this photo. I also hired a detective agency and have photos of them entering a hotel. I laid out the copied photos on the table and explained them to my daughter. No way, that's really him. I've also looked into the ex-husband's background. Turns out he's a novelist just like me. Didn't he recently publish his second book? Mom, are these photos real? Mom, of all people, you cheated with him. Lily pressed her and Alina became flustered. As Elena stayed silent, my daughter's anger heated up more and more. Elena kept quiet but after a while suddenly started crying profusely. These are fake images. Just because your affair was discovered, don't pin the same sin on me. Why do you always try to corner me like this? Please don't bully me anymore, Lily. Don't believe such random printed photos. Amidst the silence, the lawyer and I were taken aback. I had expected this reaction to the copies. So I tried to show the original photos. You really are a terrible old man. You don't know our struggles, and at the first sign of trouble, you lie to save yourself. You're the absolute worst. You're nothing to me, forever a stranger. Lily placed her hand on Alina's back and gently stroked it. Then she glared at me fiercely. She sided with Alina. Seeing this, I instinctively realized that going back to how things were was impossible. No matter what evidence I presented, she would side with Alina. Her words made me feel that. I see. Understood. 
With that, I made a call to a certain place. I had decided to use my last resort. Hello, it's me. I'm sorry to call suddenly, but I need that matter to be as if it never happened. Yes, that matter. I'm truly sorry. I'll explain more later. With that, I hung up the phone. Both of them looked at me curiously. What was that call about? Probably his mistress, Elena said coldly. Indeed, I did meet with Eric occasionally, but that was to talk about our daughter. It wasn't a romantic relationship. Is it so strange to talk to an ex-husband about his daughter? To call that cheating, how narrow-minded can you be, Elena? Seeing that Lily was on her side, Elena suddenly became more assertive. Well, indeed, Eric has been saying he wants to get back together, hasn't he? I wasn't interested before, but I've changed my mind. I've decided to get back together with Eric. Eric is a popular author currently promoting his second book. He is completely different from obscure authors like you. I've never seen your books in stores. Unlike you, he has status, money, and a blood relation with Lily. My wife boasted proudly. Then Lily's phone started ringing off the hook. She answered the phone in a panic. Hello, this is Lily speaking. Yes, yes, what? Her face grew paler and paler. By the end of the call, she was as white as a ghost. What should I do? What happened? The novelist Tom, who is scheduled to reveal his face soon, has decided to cancel it. Ha! Huh. Isn't that something not to panic about? It is a reason to panic because it's been announced for months now. It was supposed to be revealed along with the new book. Even my boss was super excited about his first face reveal. What will the fans say now that it's suddenly cancelled? Oh, why all of a sudden? I am I. My words froze both of them. Yes, this was my secret. I am the novelist, Tom. Lily, you adore the novelist Tom, right? You heard me on the phone earlier. That was me talking to my editor. I said I'm cancelling the face reveal. You both heard it, didn't you? No way. Are you saying you're Tom? That's impossible. Ignoring Lily's commotion, I answered the phone. Seeing the caller's name, I deliberately put it on speaker. Hello. Hello, is this Mike? Yes, what can I do for you, Mr. Boss? My daughter's eyes widened. She recognized the boss's voice. My wife also seemed to catch on and kept quiet. Sorry for the sudden contact. I heard you're canceling the face reveal scheduled with our company. Yes, that's correct. Why is that? I'll explain later. What do you mean later? Sorry, but please consider the face reveal cancelled for now. Please reconsider for the sake of our company. Sorry, I'm in the middle of something. I'll call back later. Ignoring the boss's eagerness, I ended the call. Then I turned back to the two of them. Elena seemed not to fully understand, but Lily was completely frozen. Sorry for lying all this time. The part about barely making ends meet with columns was also a lie. In reality, I have a savings account where I've been depositing the money I earned. I plan to share it with you all someday. The salary I put into the family account was just a portion of it. What? Why would you keep something so important a secret? I kept it hidden because I didn't want to cause you any unnecessary trouble. Nowadays, it's too easy for someone to find out about your family or address. So, I was waiting for the right moment to tell you. At Lily's wedding, I plan to announce that I am Tom. I thought it would be the perfect surprise for you, who loves my work. When I found out you were a big fan of mine, it was the happiest moment of my life. It made all the effort I put into becoming a father you could be proud of worth it. The times I was away from home were due to deadlines or research trips. The calls were from my editor. Probably, the woman's name my daughter saw was the editor. That's when the boss approached me about revealing my face. I agree because it was your company, Lily. But now, we're strangers. There's no need to go that far anymore. As I said that, Lily suddenly bowed her head and apologized. I'm sorry. I never imagined Dad was Tom. I'm really sorry for the terrible things I said. My daughter apologized, desperately trying to make it up to me. An editor who judges by status can't be trusted, I said firmly. It might be harsh as a father, but we're strangers now. As an author, I firmly rejected my daughter. Her head drooped and feeling a bit sorry for her, I decided to throw her a lifeline. Elena, why don't you introduce her to someone else? Didn't you talk about the popular author Eric? I've never met such an author at any New Year's party though. 
When I said that, she clearly looked frustrated. It seemed she finally realized I was a popular author from the incessant ringing of my phone. After a while of silence, Elena suddenly said with a smile, Hey Mike, I've decided I won't get back together with Eric after all. I didn't know you were a famous author and wrongly suspected you of cheating. Sorry, that call was from your editor, right? I'm really sorry. From now on, I'll properly support you Mike. So, let's start over, shall we? Seeing my wife say this so nonchalantly, I regretted ever marrying such a woman. Blinded by status and money, she flipped her stance so easily. I found it even more unforgivable. I hate people who change their attitude based on status. I'll be filing for damages against you and Eric. What? It's only natural. You even lied to Lily. Don't think you'll be forgiven. And Lily, I'll explain everything to the boss. Why? Because it's easier that way. I've already told him you're my daughter after finding out I am Tom. I asked him to make sure you wouldn't be ostracized at work. Well, it might be for a different reason now. What have you done? It's the result of your own actions. I was wrong to keep silent, but you did something you shouldn't have. You acted like victims, belittled me, and changed your stance as soon as you found out about my position. Live your life reflecting on what you've done. With that, the discussion ended. Due to Elena's extravagant spending during our marriage, we settled without dividing assets. Afterward, Lily was fired, possibly because I detailed the whole ordeal to her boss. Since then, she's been struggling, and there seems to be a crisis in her marriage with Brian. I heard this when I went out for drinks with Brian. Elena, having remarried Eric, seems to be struggling with debt repayment every day. They probably resorted to loans to pay for the damages. Eric was already known as a struggling author with no savings. Moreover, with the bad rumors from this incident, it's unlikely any company would want to work with him again. I plan to travel abroad for research as soon as I finish my current work. The damages for my wife and Eric will be spent on enjoying luxury overseas. I was wrong to keep silent, but you did something you shouldn't have. You acted like victims, belittled me, and flipped your stance as soon as you found out about my position. Live your life reflecting on what you've done, I said, bringing an end to our heated discussion. Elena and Lily looked shocked and unsure how to respond. With those final words, I left the room, feeling a strange mix of relief and sorrow. During our marriage, Elena had been extravagant with her spending. Because of this, we settled without dividing assets. It was a relief to avoid the hassle of splitting everything, but it also highlighted the financial recklessness that had marked much of our time together. I moved forward, determined to start anew. Not long after, I heard that Lily was fired from her job. I suspect it was because I had detailed our family ordeal to her boss. It wasn't out of spite, I just wanted the truth to be known. Since losing her job, Lily has been struggling to find her footing. She and Brian are facing a crisis in their marriage. Brian, who seemed so promising, now appeared overwhelmed by their shared troubles. One evening, I went out for drinks with Brian. He looked worn out, his once bright demeanor dimmed by stress. Over a few drinks, he confided in me about the difficulties he and Lily were facing. Their marriage, once filled with hope, was now strained by financial pressures and lingering mistrust. I felt a pang of guilt, but also knew that the path they were on was a result of their own actions. Meanwhile, Elena remarried Eric, her ex-husband, but their reunion was far from a fairy tale. They were struggling with debt repayment every day. To pay for the damages I had claimed, they probably resorted to taking out loans. Eric, who was already known as a struggling author with no savings, was in a worse situation than ever. The bad rumors from this incident spread quickly, and it was unlikely any company would want to work with him again. His once promising career was now in ruins. As for me, I had plans of my own. Once I finished my current work, I plan to travel abroad for research. The damages I received from Elena and Eric would be spent on enjoying luxury overseas. It was a bittersweet ending to a tumultuous chapter of my life. I had loved my family deeply, but their betrayal and deceit left scars that only time and distance could heal. The money would allow me to live comfortably, but it was the freedom and the fresh start that I valued most. I looked forward to new adventures and opportunities leaving behind the pain and complications of the past. It was time to embrace the future and make the most of my second chance at happiness.
My son's fiancé mocked me when we met for the first time. Your dad only finished middle school. Seriously, can you even get a job with such low qualifications? She laughed heartily. Her father joined in. I can't believe he's an unemployed high school dropout. They belittled me, and to make things worse, they served food only for themselves, excluding me. The fiancé's mother said with a big smile, I prepare meals only for my family. I've never seen someone treated so badly during a meeting between two families. I decided to get back at the five rude people, including my son, and told them to say whatever they wanted before storming out of the restaurant. My name is Eric Roberts. I just turned 59 this year, and I have a 24-year-old son named Larry. But my relationship with my son is strained, and he never comes to my house. I've often regretted how I raised him, as this led to the situation we're in now. I lost my beloved wife when Larry was still in elementary school. My wife had been frail since childhood, and she passed away at the young age of 47. At my wife's funeral, I didn't care about the judgmental looks from relatives. I sobbed like a little kid. Larry was more composed, telling me, Dad, it's sad, but let's say our goodbyes to Mom. But my grief only lasted during the funeral. Back then, I was running a real estate business I had inherited from my father. The day after my wife's funeral, I woke up to phone calls from clients. That's right, I had loyal clients to take care of and I had to raise Larry on my own. Those phone calls snapped me out of my grief, and I headed to my office. At the same time, I took part in school events and PTA meetings, filling the role my wife had played all by myself. There's no way my clumsy self could juggle work and school events perfectly on my own. I quickly gave up and decided to temporarily close my business. I handed over my clients to another real estate agency so I could spend time with Larry. But when I went to his school, Larry glared at me and said, Dad, I told you not to come. He even complained, Don't tell anyone near my dad. Without saying whose parent I was or why I was at the school, I would just be some stranger. Even today, I'm wearing a name tag that says Roberts as I participate in PTA activities. I couldn't understand why my son suddenly started giving me the cold shoulder, but it didn't take long for the truth to come out. Hey, isn't that your dad? What's he doing at school on a weekday? Does he have nothing better to do? One classmate said, My mom said that after your mom passed away, your dad became jobless, right? Larry remained silent and looked down as his classmates taunted him. I quickly rushed over and told them, I'm just taking some time off work. It's like your summer or winter break. But this only made things worse for Larry. Your dad's just pretending to be on break. Your family's poor. I'll share my bread from lunch with you, one kid said. Larry grew more and more resentful, and his classmates kept making fun of him. Despite knowing my son was being ridiculed, all I could do was look the other way. I can't remember how many times I cried alone because of how pathetic I felt. Soon, when Larry entered middle school, he started hanging out with delinquents. He would sleep over at friends' houses and hang out at gas station parking lots until late at night. Back in the day, cell phones weren't very common, and it was rare for a middle schooler to have one. Larry started coming home less and less, and I had no clue where he was or what he was doing. All I could do was apologize when I got calls from the school, saying there had been a complaint from a nearby gas station. Whenever I went to Larry's school, Larry and his rowdy classmates would call me names like good for nothing and bottom of the barrel while throwing empty cans at me. Larry had become more violent since entering middle school, and I was scared to even talk to him, not knowing what he might do. I wish I had handled things better when he was still in elementary school but what was the right way for a parent to deal with a child's bad behavior? I had no idea how to communicate with a teenager and was utterly confused. He skipped school without caring and even ran away during classes. His grades were rock bottom. At a parent-teacher conference, they told me about a private high school where even Larry could get in, and I was relieved. I was glad there was a high school he could go to, 
I thought maybe he'd calm down a bit after going to high school. Just as I hoped, after starting high school, Larry began to take his classes seriously. He studied hard, started scoring a bit above average on tests, and even made it to college. But his disdain for me remained the same. Even after going to high school, he continued to bounce from one friend's house to another, never stopping by home. After getting into college, he started living alone in a dorm and paid his tuition by working part-time. He was living independently, which was commendable, but he was cold as ice towards me. Even after he started working, he never once came home. Then, out of the blue, when Larry was about 24, he called me. He said, I've got someone I want to marry. Then he goes, next Sunday at 3 p.m., we're meeting up at a fancy restaurant, so be there, and lets me know the plans he made without even asking about my availability. I was like, hold on, this is too sudden. But when I got mad, he just said, if you can't make it, don't bother, and hung up the phone with his cold attitude. I had mixed feelings, but he's my only son, so for his sake, I went to the fancy restaurant at the time he told me to. When I got to the restaurant, her folks were already there, and they were like, who are you, all rude. I was like, you call me out of the blue, and then ask who I am? Come on. But even though I was fuming, her folks just said, no, we didn't call you, and they were just as cold as my son. Now my son Larry was standing there smirking. This guy was up to something. Still not sure I trusted what was happening, I headed inside the restaurant. There was no talk about Larry or his partner Kelly. Instead, I was the center of their attention, and they treated me like an intruder. Then Larry started saying, this guy here dropped out of high school and worked. But after mom passed, he's just been loafing around, telling Kelly and her folks. I was like, hey, this isn't the time or place, but he didn't care. Then, to top it all off, Kelly burst out laughing, saying, for real? Can a person even get hired with just a middle school education? Kelly's dad added, wow, raised by a high school dropout and layabout, but you're here with a college degree and a job at a big company. You took your old man as what not to be, huh? Praising Larry. I was too tired to argue and was about to say, say what you want, I'm out of here, but then a waiter came in from behind me with the food. Sorry for the wait, he said. Oh right, the food hadn't even come yet. I was so upset I forgot. I tried to calm down, thought I'd just eat what was in front of me and leave, but the food that got brought out was only for Larry, Kelly, and Kelly's parents. The waiter said, I'm sorry, we had a reservation for five, giving me this look. Kelly's mom said, yes, that's correct. He's not our family, so don't mind him, giving the waiter a sweet smile. The waiter looked all kinds of uncomfortable and backed out. Just as I was about to lose it, Kelly's dad cut me off. He said, We don't want anything to do with some deadbeat high school dropout. Our family and relatives are all bank employees, doctors, working at major companies. You don't belong here. Please leave. That was enough. I said, Is education and job history all you care about? Aren't you folks a bit off your rockers? and got up to leave. To that, Kelly's dad said, I work at Bank of New York Mellon, where education and job history really matter for clients' trust. But of course, a layabout like you wouldn't know. I said, oh my, you work at Bank of New York Mellon, huh? That's quite impressive, and walked out. I said that as I was leaving, but they didn't hear me. The next day, I paid a visit to Bank of New York Mellon, where Kelly's dad works. Being called a deadbeat by my son, his classmates, and my son's fiancé and her family, I must admit, I'm not actually a deadbeat. After my wife passed away, I temporarily closed my real estate business. Let me clarify it was just a temporary closure. I didn't shut it down for good. After my wife's passing, I switched my business to online management so I could prioritize my son's school events and PTA meetings. When I had a physical store, most of my clients were neighbors, but after switching to online management, I could serve customers from all over the country, like people living in small towns about an hour's drive from the nearest train station, 
and even Americans living abroad. I started getting more consultations about renting and buying properties from these folks. Thanks to the internet, I could expand my property portfolio and cater to a broader clientele. Running a real estate business online made things possible that seemed like a dream. Additionally, I was quite active in stocks and investments as a hobby. Currently, I have $70 million deposited in Bank of New York Mellon, where Kelly's dad works. Upon arriving at the bank, I promptly requested to speak with the branch manager and informed him about everything that happened the day before. I said, I was told by one of your employees that this bank operates on trust, built on educational background and work history. So I've lost all trust in this bank because of that statement. Could you please proceed with the account closure? The branch manager kept apologizing profusely and finally explained the account closure process with a face on the verge of tears. Oh, I almost forgot about something important. There's this troublemaker who has not paid the rent for the apartment I own for three years. I had been letting it slide, thinking he's my son, but no more. I mailed my son a notice demanding three years' worth of rent. Five days later, Kelly's dad and my bonehead son came storming into my house. Why did you rat me out to the branch manager? That was underhanded, dad. What's the deal with that notice? If you're the manager, cover for me. I sighed and said, I lost trust in the bank after learning about your practice of judging clients based on education and work history. Are you panicking just because of what one person said? Do you have something to hide? And Larry, just because we're family doesn't mean you can skip paying rent. Pay your own rent. Kelly's dad shouted, because you went around stirring the pot. I got a bunch of complaints for my other clients. My boss chewed me out because of what you did. The nerve. Oh no, I didn't stir the pot. I just shared this story as casual conversation with my relatives and clients. I didn't tell them to close their accounts, I said with a smile. My son snapped at me, What clients, dad? You're just a deadbeat, aren't you? Do you think a deadbeat could afford to build a huge house like this in such a prime location and still maintain this lifestyle? I even did some renovations recently, I replied. My son looked baffled and said, huh? What's that? Did you go into debt or something? I'm really fed up with you. I took a break from my real estate job for a while and then switched to running an online business, which I'm still doing. How many times do I have to tell you I'm not a bum? I said. My son turned pale and said, What? I had no clue. I thought you were just working part-time. Kelly's dad started yelling, You're a real piece of work, keeping your occupation secret even from your own son. Annoyed, I said, Say whatever you want, and closed the front door. Outside, I heard them shouting, You've ruined my reputation. I'm gonna sue you. I can't believe I've been duped by my old man for this long. I'm not gonna let him do this to me. They were making a ruckus, but after about five minutes of shouting, they seemed to get exhausted and it got quiet. Once they realized that shouting was meaningless, I figured they wouldn't bother coming around here again. I let out a sigh of relief and went to make myself a cup of coffee. Just then, I heard my son's voice outside again. You big fat liar. What are you still doing here? I said as I looked out the window to see Kelly's dad and my son spray painting my front door. You've got to be kidding me. What are they up to now? Just as I was about to go outside and give them a piece of my mind, I heard a police siren getting closer. Could it be that someone in the neighborhood called the cops? My hunch was right. When I went outside, the three of them were being detained by the police who had shown up because of a neighbor's complaint. There he is, that big fat liar. I lost all my credibility at work because of him, they shouted. The police calmly loaded them into the patrol car, saying, All right, all right, we'll take it from here. Then one of the officers, who seemed to have just noticed me, approached with a strangely cheerful expression. Sir, would you please come with us to give your statement? Why me? I thought, but I guess I'm the victim here. I'm gonna spill the beans on all their shenanigans. 
When we got to the police station, I showed the cops a video from my phone. It was footage from the security camera I installed at my front door. The camera had recorded all the yelling and antics. What a great piece of evidence, the officer exclaimed with a sparkle in his eye. And my questioning was over in a jiffy. My son and Kelly's dad were given a stern warning by the police and had to sign a restraining order to keep their distance from me. It turns out the whole neighborhood had witnessed their crazy behavior. One of my son's co-workers who lives nearby had been blabbering about it at the office. Hey, you won't believe it, but Larry was caught spray-painting his own father's house and got hauled off by the cops. I was so shocked I recorded the whole thing. My son became the talk of the town at his workplace and with clients, and his boss ended up demoting him. I went to report the incident to Bank of New York Mellon again, where Kelly's dad worked. When I showed the manager the security camera footage on my phone, his face turned white as a sheet. I heard that Kelly's dad finally got fired, and naturally, she called off the engagement with Larry. Larry and Kelly's family both fled far away to a rural area. Apparently, Kelly's parents even came to work part-time at the gas station in the sticks run by my brother. They were no good and couldn't get the hang of stocking shelves, no matter how many times they tried. I showed them and had to give them the boot right away. Word spread quickly, and nearby gas stations and farmers did the same. According to my brother, Kelly's parents can't seem to land a steady job and are bouncing from one gig to another at gas stations and farms. Furthermore, I heard that Kelly showered her boyfriends, including my son, with expensive gifts like watches, and she got into debt because of that. The little money her parents make from their part-time jobs apparently goes free into paying off Kelly's debts. It's a mystery how they're making ends meet. It's been six years since then, and my son is now 30. It seems like he's changed for the better after being treated with kindness from folks in the small town he moved to. He came to me a couple of times and apologized sincerely. He said, I was naive and immature. I didn't even try to understand your job and just labeled you as a good for nothing. I can't apologize enough for how much I regret it. Seeing the change in my son's attitude, I decided to let him move in with me. Now he's working at a company near my place, and little by little, he's helping me out with my work too. But don't get me wrong, he's still inexperienced, and I don't trust him completely. I'm hesitant to hand over all my work to him, but I'm going to observe his behavior and attitude towards work and make decisions accordingly. If he proves he's really turned his life around, I might consider handing over the reins of my business. But if I told him that, he might get too excited and say, for real? I'll hand in my one week's notice tomorrow and do something impulsive. I'm living with my son, holding on to the hope that one day I'll feel confident enough to trust him with everything. After the incident with the police, the news about Larry and Kelly's dad spread quickly. The neighborhood couldn't stop talking about it. One of Larry's co-workers, who lives nearby, blabbered about it at the office saying, hey, you won't believe it, but Larry was caught spray-painting his own father's house and got hauled off by the cops. I was so shocked I recorded the whole thing. Because of this, my son became the talk of the town at his workplace, and his boss ended up demoting him. I went to report the incident to Bank of New York Mellon again, where Kelly's dad worked. When I showed the manager the security camera footage on my phone, his face turned white as a sheet. He was speechless. I heard that Kelly's dad finally got fired, and naturally, she called off the engagement with Larry. Larry and Kelly's family both fled far away to a rural area. Apparently, Kelly's parents even came to work part-time at a gas station run by my brother. They were no good and couldn't get the hang of stocking shelves, no matter how many times they tried. My brother said they were a complete disaster, always messing up and causing trouble. Despite all this, my focus remained on my son. It's been a long road, but I believe he's starting to understand the importance of hard work and responsibility. He's apologized for his past behavior and seems genuinely remorseful. 
I've told him that actions speak louder than words, and I'm watching to see if his actions match his apologies. Living with him again has been challenging, but it's also been a chance for us to rebuild our relationship. I see glimpses of the man he could become, and it gives me hope. I haven't decided yet whether I'll hand over my business to him, but I'm giving him a chance to prove himself. If he shows he can be responsible and trustworthy, then maybe, just maybe, I'll consider it. But for now, I'm taking it two days at a time, hoping for the best and preparing for the worst.